Well, hi, I'm Noah Bradley with Handmade House TV, and on today's episode, I'm going to share with you how I build a pair of sawhorses. In the past episodes, I've talked about the materials that I was going to use and the features that we'd like to have in a sawhorse, but on this one, I'm going to show you actually how I build sawhorses. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to visit uh, my 30-year-old pair of sawhorses and see what we can learn from them. We'll only spend a minute or two there, but it's always wise to go back to something that has proven to be durable and attractive, to learn from it why it has survived as long as it has, and also to seek out its shortcomings and how we might improve upon it. We do this for sawhorses, we do this for everything, and we really ought to do it for the homes that we build. Seek out old antique vintage homes and learn what they have to offer, why they have survived for 200 to 300 years, and then uh, figure out what new amenities we can add to them to make them even better. Uh, then the second thing we'll do is that we'll go ahead and I'll give you all of the measurements and angles that I used on building this set of sawhorses. And then finally we'll go through the actual cutting of the material and the tricky assembly that comes thereafter. So stay tuned. I think all the saw marks actually adds character. I noticed uh, here in this, uh, in the end graining of the legs, uh, that there was a, there's a lot of softness and a lot of bit of funkitude, and that's because the ends of end grains of wood tends to draw in moisture, and there's definitely been a little bit of uh, a little bit of a dry rot or rotting that's going on in here. So when I'm applying a finished coat to my new set, I'm going to try to make sure and soak in plenty of, of wood sealer into this area so that it will stop water, fil water uh, infiltration here and prevent rot. Also you will notice that the sawhorses do rock and uh, that's likely because I did not glue at that period. So 30 years of, of use of uh, stress back and forth has worn the uh, screw holes into the wood. I'm certain uh, a little bit loose. You'll notice for the ends back at that time, I used just a, a scrap piece of plywood. Here I did use uh, one, two, three, three screws on each end and it looked like uh, years later someone came in and drove some roofing nails in here in order to increase the strength which made me think that five would be a better number to use on the ends uh, than three but one thing I wanted you to really notice and I hope the camera can see this uh, is that uh, this nail is sticking out about an inch which is the result again of nails don't hold when under stress so back and forth back and forth and the nails work their way out of wood uh, and whereas screws uh, that are much much older than this particular nail are still relatively close in there although she sure is a a rocketing thing and then up here I, I only used two screws on the end and I came in with three on my latest and of course, of course I did, applied all the glue which I think will uh, create even a more longer and more durable uh, sawhorse. Now if you notice down here on the bottom railing uh, let me get my camera just right uh, the old uh, railing is a bit loose and a bit wobbly there. I don't think that I would use this for a step today uh, to climb up on the top of my sawhorse here. And uh, it looks like I was using a pattern of three. Uh, today, th on the newest sawhorses, I used them up at the top, two at the top, one at the bottom. And then I actually came around the back side and came in with one as well. Uh, in order to uh, basically it, uh, prob probably increase by 50% to twice as much uh, strength in this particular area. Uh, plus again with the glue it wouldn't allow that to open up and uh, allow moisture to come in place. Uh, so, um, so there's a lot to, be, to, a lot to be learned for something proven uh, not only in, in the good things about how it is held together uh, but also in its shortcomings and how we might improve that today. Well, all right, so let me give you some measurements on this particular set of sawhorses that I built. And I must say I'm unusually proud of it, but 
just because it's my set of sawhorses, it's my ideal set that I built this time, it doesn't mean that it needs to be your ideal set. That uh, take what I've learned and adapt it to your own use and build your own unique set. And, and when you get it done, please send me a picture of what you come up with. The, the top plate, the top uh, member of my sawhorses uh, came out to be about 33 inches long. They are about five and a half inches at the bottom and about four and a half at the top. Uh, I used an angle gauge and uh, this is about 12 inches uh, out of 90 degrees. So it's a little bit uh, angled and that made for a nice fit coming down the side. So this would be the same, uh, this uh, end piece would be at a 12 degree angle uh, as well in order to get that pitch in place. And the dimensions of this end piece are, they're about 10 inches uh, tall from top to bottom. Uh, the bottom is, oh, about 11 and a quarter. And the top is about a little over seven inches. Uh, wide there so that gives you some good idea about how to create um, your end piece. Now when it comes to the sides here uh, the angle pitch changed so the angles again on the end are, are t about 12 degrees and the ones on the sides are about 8 degrees. Uh, so this is an 8 degree cut uh, this is an 8 degree cut um, and the, the bottom of the legs as well. Uh, this uh, gives a bit of a different spread. So these are rather compound angle cuts here which are perfect to use uh, when it comes time for us to use our miter saw which is a very handy tool to have and it amazes me that the wonderful tools that we have available today from table saws to compound sliding miter saws that make angles so easy to make that carpenters will bypass using them on a sawhorse and just cram things together and nail them. Uh, so the, uh, the, the side rails uh, that I made out of uh, cherry are 28 and a half inches at the bottom and about 28 at the top. Uh, somewhere in that range and again uh, the, the, the height difference I made was, was uh, that this would be 16 inches up and this would be 32 inches up uh, total so it's a half a halfway step and it looks like uh, actually it's 31 and a half inches so again I tried a little bit of uh, uh, there's a combination of accuracy and there's a little bit of free wheeling going on in building a sawhorse and that's one of the the benefits the beauties of building a sawhorse and that is that you can really express yourself you can put a lot of really nice workmanship into it uh, you can get things uh, of high quality you can use high quality materials you can take a lot of joy in building something that is really beautiful and attractive uh, but you're also not bound by the fear of perfectionism. You're not building a piece of furniture. So when you build some, a beautiful pair of sawhorses, you have something that you admire, something that other people will admire. And if uh, that critic comes in your life who points out something flaw, something a little bit crooked, uh, you can just say, well, it's just a pair of sawhorses. And so th that is one of the many joys of sawhorses is is the freedom of expression to, to make a piece of artwork, of useful artwork, uh, but also it doesn't have to be perfect. It can have a little bit of character to it. And so the legs, the legs came out to about 32 inches in length, but since they are angled, that's where the 31 and a half inches came into play. So with all that said, let's get started on actually building these saw horses. If you recall in the last episode, I had some old heart pine flooring that was stained with a lot of motor oil and gasoline, and it, it smelled pretty bad. It was, it was uh, stained and spotty, and it just wasn't usable uh, for uh, interior work in a home. 
Uh, so the, the first uh, process I did was to remove uh, one edge off of each of the planks in order to give me something to work off of. Also notice I'm working outside on these videos. I, I do my best to demonstrate to you uh, how a carpenter works on a job site and also how one can work with a minimal amount of tools. Uh, typically when it comes to table saws I just use a portable table saw uh, any of the quality ones that they make nowadays are nice. I think my favorite would be a Bosch. Uh, here in this particular video, I'm using an old Porter cable uh, that uh, is particularly quiet. That's the, that's the one feature I like about it. Uh, but it is heavy and it's a little bit cumbersome to move to a job site. Uh, you can see that the old pine just rips through uh, nice and clear. And of course, before I'm doing this, I am uh, I've, uh, I checked for any nails that might be on the edge. And if you notice, this one particular piece is has got a lot of motor oil on it. It uh, it pretty well stunk going through the table saw. Once I have a clean edge cut on all of these pieces of, of heart pine, one that I can consistently work off of. Uh, I take a measurement and determine exactly the best thickness that I can for uh, the legs that I'm about ready to create. I lock it in place and then I go ahead and I start cutting out the legs one at a time. Now, now on these sawhorses that I'm building, I'm creating them from rough material. In other words, I'm making the material that will make the sawhorse. Uh, if you choose not to go this path of using uh, was, uh, lumber from a sawmill or salvaged wood. You, a lot of this process uh, can be skipped and you, can, uh, you already are working from dimensional lumber, but I find that if you use salvage material and saw mo sawmill material, you end up with a, a much more unique, a much more handcrafted, a handmade set of sawhorses. So if you want a handmade house, uh, a good time to start making that handmade product is by is by your saw horses being handmade as well. Now my original plan was to build one set of saw horses, but for quite often it makes sense to batch make saw horses as you're making it. And I believe I mentioned this in a previous episode that uh, that uh, that two or three sets of saw horses is a handy thing to have. And while you have your material set up, while you have your machinery going. It really doesn't take that much longer to go ahead and make an extra set or two. So I would encourage you to build two or three. Here I am uh, with a miter gauge setting the angle on the table saw uh, for, the, uh, for the top plate for the walnut that I'll be building. Um, and I want to get it just right. I want to get the angles just right. And um, it's a, the, the old axiom of measuring twice and cutting once is very true, that uh, you want to make sure that you're cutting it. You're not taking off uh, too much. If you take off too little, you can always uh, run it through the saw again and take off a little bit more. Um, but for some reason, the odds are always against us that we end up taking off too much. Now, before I ran this finished uh, old heart pine through, a planer. I made sure and denailed all of the lumber, and uh, I I I, can, I cannot uh, more highly recommend a Dewalt planer. I, I get no compensation from them. It's not like every U tool I use is yellow, uh, but nonetheless uh, they they do a magnificent job. And once I finished uh, planing all the lumber, I had a beautiful stack of uh, of dimensional lumber. And uh, it was all uh, an inch or two longer than I needed it uh, because of all the processing that it went through. If you notice on the left here, I have the cherry lumber that I'm going to use uh, for the side rails of the sawhorses. Uh, just gorgeous wood, uh, stout, um, extremely strong. Uh, I'll have no hesitancy in, in climbing and using it for material. I think it provides some nice visual interest. Uh, here's that cedar that I had left over. I ran it once through the planer and it just came out beautiful. And I, was, uh, I was well pleased with it. It's extremely light and weight and blends in color very nice 
with the, with the hard pine I'm going to use for legs. And here's the top plates, the top boards. Uh, you can see the angle cuts on the ends here, uh, all out of walnut. Just a, just a beautiful wood, a joy to work with. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege to have a nice piece of wood that you can work with every day. I know that I've received some comments. Uh, why would you use such a beautiful wood on a sawhorse? Uh, but the fact is, if you're building your own home and if you're a carpenter, uh, you're, you're working with your sawhorses all the time. So why not work with, uh, with something that brings you joy, something that you find attractive? Uh, rather than uh, some kind of scrap wood. And then last of all, here's the selection of, of legs that I have for the sawhorses. Uh, this was all of that old oily flooring that I ran through the planer. And uh, I think it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's a little bit more stained, a little bit more motley uh, than, what I, than what I would use in a house, but I think it adds a lot of character to it. And of course the old heart pine is uh, stronger and stouter than what we have uh, access to today. And I ended up with several extra pieces, which is what I really wanted, uh, because some of them are knotty, and uh, I wanted to eliminate any of them that I felt were unusually too weak for the sawhorses. So after I got all my material all lined up but in a little bit longer than what I needed, it was time to start cutting all the complex angles associated uh, to get the lumber to the exact right length and that's when it's time to bring out the sliding compound miter saw. If you're looking for, uh, for tools, if it's time for you to buy tools, the first two big power tools that one must have. Uh, is some form of table saw, a lightweight quality uh, table saw that you can easily portable, portably take to, uh, to use to build your home. But also you can't beat a, uh, a sliding compound saw that uh, the, wor the work that they do is quick and it's perfect and it's relatively safe. And whenever I'm working I always uh, spend a lot of time and create uh, a perfect board a dimensionally uh, accurate one that I'm very pleased with and then I'll mark it as a pattern board and use it to mark the rest of the boards. Uh, it, uh, it gives me a consistent uh, product and uh, it's a lot quicker than measuring each individual board. And so here we have all of our, our lumber cut out. You can see the pretty walnut in the middle that we'll use for the top of the sawhorses. On both sides of it you see the heart pine for the legs, uh, the little pieces of uh, cedar down on the ground that I'm going to use for the ends, and of course that we'll use for uh, the rails of the sawhorses. Here, in the, if you notice what I'm doing is that uh, I have already created uh, one of the side rails with pre-drilled holes exactly where I want them. And so I'm using it as a pattern board in order to put, uh, in order to pre-drill holes in all of the other railings. The reason why we pre-drill our holes is that screws have a tendency to go, their, go the direction they want through the grain, through the least resistance, and if we pre-drill our holes there's less tendency of splitting and there's less tendency of the screw going in a direction that we don't necessarily want it to go. Another thing I'd like you to notice is the, is the very ends of each of the boards uh, that I'm using for side rails and that is that I put a small chamfer cut uh, using the sliding compound saw in order to, re to remove some of the bulkiness of this that I thought that what was visually most attractive to have for a rail on the side was something about three quarters of an inch thick uh, but I thought that something a little bit thicker would, would be more stout, more steady uh, for me to use for railing 
And uh, so I did the chamfer in order to reduce the visual effect of it being so thick. And always after I drill my holes, I always like to come back with a chisel and just clean up the little bit of fuzz, the little bit of ridge that's created from the drilling process in order that when it gets time to do the gluing, uh, that, uh, that there's nothing standing between it so I get a perfect adhesion. And if you notice this little bit here, this is, uh, this is what I call a chamfer bit. And, uh, or a bevel bit and uh, after I drill my holes I like to stick this in my in my drill and I just come back and it's a it's, it's kind of an easy fun process but what it does is that it creates a, a little hole pocket so that the very end of that screw will slide on in flush and not stick out and grab my clothing or my finger in the future uh, it'll give a nice smooth finish without without going in and, and cracking the wood. And really it only takes just a fraction of a second uh, to change out the bit and to, uh, and to go ahead and just do this little effect. You can get uh, drill bits that have this little chamfer uh, already pre-made into it, uh, but actually I find this little little piece a lot easier. much nicer and the screw just will slide on in there and go flush so after I have all the holes pre-drilled in the side rails I lay my legs up onto my little workbench which is by the way sitting on a set of old saw horses that I have um, and then I mark it carefully uh, for gluing purposes uh, exactly where the two meet so that I'll be able to glue it and then I partially drill uh, through the holes of the railing into the legs uh, so that I don't split out any of the legs in any way and that the holes line up nice and sweet now remove the rail and of course it's time to come in and just clean up just any little bit of protrusion that drilling those holes might have made. And then currently I'm a big fan of Gorilla Glue. And again, I'm not promoting it. I don't have it on my website. I don't have an affiliate link for it. Uh, it just tends to be an amazing glue. Uh, and I'm spreading it between the lines that I previously set just a moment ago. And um, generally I have to be patient with it because it, uh, it moves slowly from the bottom of the tube to the top. And never fails. I get it on my fingers and on my clothes. Uh, some folks will just leave it and let it be just as it comes out of the bottle, a squirt line. But I like to, to spread it around and make sure that I get complete coverage everywhere I want and hopefully not where I don't want it to be. And uh, one of the characteristics of Gorilla Glue is that as it dries, as it sets, it expands. And so there will come some of it uh, that will squirt out of the uh, seams where we glue things together. And you'll see that later in this video. And uh, the time to clean it up is as long after it dries. The next day you just come in with a utility knife and uh, cut it off, scrape it off. It comes off very easy. Uh, you don't want to work with it. Uh, you don't want to try to do any cleanup of glue in the wrong place. Uh, while it's still wet, are you just going to end up making a bigger mess? Now 
Now a lot of folks will wonder why it is that I go to so much trouble to build such a nice saw horse. And you know, part of the reason is, uh, there's a lot of reasons, as I've told you, that uh, uh, there's a lot of wonderful virtues to having a nice saw horse and, and to only having to build them every 30 years. But I'd like to tell you a story, if I could. And so here you see me setting the, uh, the side rail into place, right back in line, everything lining up as perfect and pretty as what I possibly can. And now I'm going to go ahead and screw these together, uh, a really tight fit, uh, which between the screws and the glue uh, is going to just give an incredibly strong side combination here. But anyway, back to that story. Uh, years ago, um, I met a fine woman who owned a beautiful home, uh, and in her home she had a, a wonderful uh, central uh, window uh, that high lit the whole room, and in front of this central window uh, was a table, and the table um, is was uh, was of of, of poor lumber, uh, poorly crafted. Uh, something that looked like um, your average individual could have built it uh, in, uh, in an hour's time uh, with little thought, and chances are that's exactly what it was. Um, but the, the story behind it was it, was it was a table that this woman's father had built. And uh, chances are, and from what I gathered from the woman, uh, this was uh, her dad just needed something to put his tools on and just spent uh, a few minutes uh, randomly uh, piecing something together that he would temporarily use. And uh, he had no idea that as time progressed uh, that he would pass away and that that one table would be his legacy. Uh, that that would be something that his daughter would treasure and locate in the central room of her home, uh, something that might be passed down for generations as something that great-great-great-grandfather hand-built. And I would think that that man probably has rolled around in his grave many times, uh, wishing that he had spent a little bit more time uh, putting together something of a higher level of craftsmanship than what he did. So here I am um, moving, those, moving the side legs that, uh, that I've um, created and you can see that it's time for me to um, mount the top uh, board to it which is a little bit tricky and uh, you can see that I'm uh, more or less I'm kind of lining it up by eye. I want to I want a kind of an equal amount of wood on each end and I want those legs to line up to the top of the walnut piece. I don't want the legs to protrude beyond the walnut, uh, but as close to flush uh, as possible would be, would be perfect. And so once I get it exactly where I want it, always a good thing to have some scrap lumber on hand to uh, use for shims and such. I'm just thankful for these little cutoff pieces from when I made the legs for, for exactly hold, helping me hold this in place. But once I get the legs exactly where I want them, then I go ahead and transfer where they will be on the top walnut piece. And then I'll go ahead and I'll pre-drill the holes. And again, if you remember on my old set of saw horses, that I used two screws at this point. Uh, but on this one, I'm going to drill three holes. And I'm doing it all by eye here. I want to make sure that the screws will penetrate uh, through uh, the walnut and not, uh, not come out at any kind of crazy angle. Uh, but again, I don't want the screws to necessarily line up with a single grain of the walnut, which uh, might cause a, some kind of split out. 
So uh, I'm not trying to be perfect in my alignment of the screws, uh, but I'm trying to locate them in an area of maximum strength. And the, uh, the length of the screws that I will be putting in here uh, will be uh, three and a half inches long. Uh, the screws that I used on the railing below, uh, I think they worked out to about an inch and a half long, um, which held together two inches worth of wood, one inch uh, le thick legs, one inch thick uh, side rails, and they were countersunk a bit, so they worked out just, just perfect. And so after after I get all, all six of the holes drilled, uh, then I'm coming back uh, with my little um, special uh, angled um, bit there. The last thing I want to do is cause any split out uh, when I'm applying the screws here in the end. So I want to relieve as any pressure that can possibly happen in this end. And so now I've got everything screwed, and I carefully remove that. And remember, I have marked the walnut to exactly where the legs will go. And of course, I'll clean off the back of the legs with my chisel for any little fuzz that might have been created. And I'll do the same for this walnut. And then it's time, of course, for more glue. and spread it around nicely. And now that I have my glue all ready, it's time to bring back that side of the sawhorse that I have it and do my best to carefully set it in place so as not to make any more of a mess than I have to. It's all a process. There's no hurry. I don't feel like I'm under the gun. There's no boss complaining at me. I'm just enjoying the process. I'm savoring every moment of it. I'm carefully trying to think through each process so I end up with a finished product that I'm proud of.
Well, all right, I hope you enjoyed this episode on building sawhorses, and I hope that you'll come see us on our next episode where I reveal to you exactly how I make my waterproof sealer that sometimes I use on vintage logs, a lot of times I use on, on a ceiling joist, and uh, it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a trade secret of mine. Uh, I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, actually, the National Park Service uses the same sort of mixture for the same sort of reasons. And I'm going to get into the reasons, and I'm going to show you exactly how I mix them, and I'm going to apply them on the sawhorse. And by the way, let me just show you this one little teaser photograph. Just a few hours after applying this sealer to these sawhorses, a rain shower set in, and you can see how the water just beaded up on top. It was a thing of beauty, and I know well that these sawhorses will be a lot more protected in the future, that they'll be able to stand up to the use and abuse of a job site and will outlast me and could very well serve my children and my grandchildren well into the future. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, five new members of the A uh, Handmade House Guild, uh, members of the Academy, uh, Lance Harding, Harden, H-A-R-D-I-N, sorry about that, Lance. Uh, John Bagley, Timothy Polish, Peter Fenelio, and author Leslie. Guys, thank you so much for joining us within the Handmade House Guild where I reveal all of my secrets about building uh, the perfect handmade house. Uh, uh, building a, a sawhorse is just the first step towards building a home. Uh, if you can build yourself sawhorse, you can build yourself a shed. If you can build yourself a shed, you can build yourself a house. And I'm not talking about a vinyl-clad thing with a 30-year mortgage on it. I'm talking about something beautiful, something that you will treasure the rest of your life, something that will make your life better. I hope that you'll join me on next week's Handmade House TV. And until then, this is Noah Bradley. You have a great week.